and we're delighted to have Mr. Alan D. Duncan with us today. Uh, I know Alan and uh, ourselves go back a bit um, uh, and Alan has been a very good support of a lot of initiatives coming out of the Cork University Business School, but I'm going to allow Alan to say a few words to introduce himself. Alan, over to you. Thanks, Paddy. Uh, as you say, we go back some time now. I think it's nearly six or seven years that I've been involved um, in, in various aspects of um, supporting uh, the information management and, and data driven business um, courses at, at UCC and, and also some of the, the work across on um, on digital uh, healthcare as well. So. Um, it's it's been my you know privilege to to be part of that um, you know working with the UCC team. Um, broader than that, uh, I'm I'm currently one of the research group in Gartner, who you know probably the the world's leading research and advisory uh, business, um, focusing on data and analytics agenda, um, particularly things are from from my own. Uh, areas of interest around the business value of data, the opportunity value and the creativity that comes from uh, building different sorts of relationships and, and, and engagement models and how to quantify that business va value and also very much the um, the human aspects of the change that that brings in terms of the way we want to interact with people, the the behavioral aspects of of a data driven organization. Um, if we're talking about technologies and platforms and tools, I can have that conversation as well, of course, um, as a as a you know significantly technology driven uh, research house. Um, we do get into those conversations, but I would say you know the human aspects of, of what we do in, in data and, and analytics and information management is probably my uh, my core uh, work all the way back and, and it's been a long and checkered career now um, and uh, you know to when I graduated from Aberdeen, Aberdeen University with a with an engineering degree I had no idea where that was going to lead um, and uh, certainly there was no aspiration to be an industry analyst back then I wouldn't have even been able to say what it was um, so as with so many exciting things in life I, I've probably been a bit of an accidental tourist a, a lot along the way seen what develops and um, and take the opportunities as they arise but 30 years on in the industry uh, and here I am you know and, and hopefully something that's meaningful and useful to uh, to the, the the folks that are interested in today's discussion. Yeah very interesting so I'd have started life on the engineering side as well and what always fascinates me and when was the realization that there was nearly that human aspect to data because it's it's not uh, it's definitely not the dominant view out in lots of, of organizations right. that there is that human element when did that when did that dawn on you? So I suppose I got in like many people I got into data technology develop software development um because i wasn't necessarily that comfortable with people i was a bit of a nerdy kid um you know i was i was into books i was into maths i was you know science um and and there was comfort in the machines and and i mean i started to learn to code when i was about 12 you know i mean i taught myself to 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 code on on my rubber key zx spectrum plugged into the television and um and all through you know going doing maths and science at school into engineering at university and then getting into industry the things that i was good at were the technology factors i'd like to think i was yeah, you know, a pretty darn good C programmer and and you know pretty hot on programming SQL you know, and so on. But as things developed, I started to recognize that maybe folks who aren't just great at developing, coding, problem solving, you know, that's not the only aspect that actually gets success. And round about the age of 28, 29. And I had just moved from Scotland to to London um, uh, to you know I'd been the opportunity to, to to travel down south and to take take a job at KPMG actually, and when I started to realise that the way that KPMG did their work and the way that we engaged with clients and with each other 
was less about the technical expertise and more about the way in which we communicated with people and helped others to communicate. And that was a big, big realization for me that the technical excellence and, and you know being the best I could be at doing the job was necessary, but it wasn't sufficient. Um, and, and so at a personal level, I started to look for opportunities to say, how can I enhance my own performance and, and um, progress and whatnot by augmenting what I hope and still is, you know, good technology knowledge and, and so on with the ability to communicate that with other people. And that then becomes not about the technology and the techniques itself. It's about very much a, a, a human view. Um, and I, I suppose over the last, well, now 20 years, I've increasingly made that my, my kind of, yeah, contribution to, to industry, whatever the hell that means, to, to make sure that being able to identify outcome, be able to bring people with us to the deliberate and conscious and learnable skills of how to influence people around us um, become, you know, part of, uh, part of being successful um, and actually also helps you to choose your own pathway. A bit like the, the kind of the, the books I used to read as a nerdy kid back then of, you know, choose your own adventure. Um, the, by being able to communicate more effectively, you, you get more opportunities to, to choose those pathways for yourself rather than have them dictated to you. Mm. And it's it's very interesting, like over that period of time, Alan, you know, so 30 years, whatever it is, you've seen, sure. you, you've seen lots of evolution, hopefully lots of change. Yes. But to what extent have organisations truly changed in a positive way towards data and maybe introduce even that more human mm -hmm. element and combine it with the technical, the hard well, and soft parts? So let's, if we go back, maybe... 10 years, we, that's I, when I would say there was a real shift in the way that we started to have to think about data more deliberately in business and, 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 and in the way that organizations functioned. Because of the uh, acceleration in the ability to put sensors in um, our world, um, because of these darn things, right? That has has made the use of information, the availability of information, the ease of consumption of information pervasive, right? It's not just for being able to deliver it to you, but actually also as a device with a whole bunch of sensors in it. Now, somebody somewhere knows where I am, more or less what I'm doing, you know, um, et cetera, through the signal that the data gives in terms of the consumption of the services and apps I'm using, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that really came into focus, I would say about 10 years ago. And we saw this burgeoning growth in big data, um, you know, the ability to do an analytics, the, the, the language started to be about democratizing business intelligence and so on and so on. And I, I'm, you know, Maybe maybe my history is slightly off here, but for, you know I'm, I'm recalling that that real sea change in our industry took place about ten years ago, and then maybe maybe three years ago there was another sea change in everybody spending lots and lots of money on data platforms, data warehouses, data lakes. Um, business intelligence tools, and everybody going, we're spending a lot of money. We're not necessarily seeing a lot of benefit coming out of this. What's going on? These are all good things to do. We know how to engineer them. There's better and worse practices for how we build and, and do those things. You know, I can. it's more accessible because of the uptake of cloud type solutions, which mean it's no longer, I have to physically install things in, you know, extra machines into my data center. You know, it, I can spin up a new environment in 24 hours using a cloud solution, et cetera. Yet still, 
we're still having the discussion about well, where's the value in all of this. We know there's value, but we can't demonstrate it, etc. And this is where maybe three years ago now, this idea of data literacy started to really take hold. Um, and I think it's taken about three years for that effect to play out to where now I would say as an embryonic idea three, four years ago of, oh, we need to actually have different skills and knowledge and understanding and behaviors in our people to really properly take advantage of these advances in data and analytics um, solutions. That's now, I think, become a mainstream idea that says, in order to really get best benefit and value, it's not about the tools and platforms, it's about having people who are able to engage with the world in a different way through the lens of data as the way to inform our understanding. Now, that has not just business challenges, it has societal impacts. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if, if we look at, at the US and as, as, a, as a typical representation of a, of a broader societal thing, you know, it, it's a very small proportion of uh, US students who go beyond doing math uh, beyond the 10th grade. Um, you know, science is not necessarily seen as something cool still. Um, I think the world is changing and, you know, <laughs> we're getting to the point where, you know, the world is run by the nerds. Hurrah, great. I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah, I are one. Um, but um, it still means that actually we've got to bring people with us and, you know, we've seen a lot in science communication, et cetera. I mean, the pandemic's been a classic example where the facts and the data, et cetera, the science is clear, yet there are so many people that don't need no stinking science. The mm. Climate change, the science is clear, yet we've got folks saying this isn't a thing and so on. So as folks who are interested in data, who are interested in an evidence-based approach, who see data-driven decision-making as the right and proper way to take a um, deliberate and considered view of the things that we choose to do and how we go about them, we've got a hell of a lot of work to do mm -hmm. to make that accessible and meaningful to folks who are I not scientists yeah, and so that's on. right and, and and i remember um uh, jeff jonas it must be at least a decade ago at this stage he was was with ibm at the time they were talking about that our ability to acquire and procure data and technology was was increasing exponentially right. but our ability to make sense of it was literally flatlining nearly and Indeed. and i think jeff would have spoken about you know how uh, the more data we get we seem to become more stupid at the same time relative to the data we've access to um, like and we've been talking about this a, a, a yeah. lot for, and for a long time yeah. and I know you talk a lot about data cultures bringing uh, data driven cultures into sure. organization what can we do about it in real terms I do we have the terms data literacy you know, yes. big data but what what can we do about it so it's a combination of things I think body and, and and I'm not necessarily sure we've even yet reached peak idiocracy so um you know we 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 might have a way to go before there's an upside starting but I think you know I would ask anybody who's who's listened to today's discussion between us to 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 think in terms of what can you do as a, as a champion for a more evidence based considered you know data driven approach if we as a community can ask some really, really simple questions, um, then that's going to help. So two things that I always try to say in any situation. Firstly, if we're going to be considering doing something, or changing a business process and building a new application, asking people to work in a different way, then our duty of care is to ask what does this do to our data? And represent the data explicitly in the conversation about the change that we're making. Right? The second thing, almost in the same breath, is what does our data tell us we should do? And if we as, as the champions and translators of this kind of data-driven view can take that view that says, what does this do to our data? What does our data tell us to do? then we're already getting 
into a conversation that, that changes the way people discuss the problem. Mm-hmm. That then leads to a significant, more far-reaching view around education, training, coaching, that as professionals in the data and analytics arena, and particularly as we get into you know, leadership roles, chief data officer, chief analytics officer, head of data science, et cetera, head of business intelligence, then the, our responsibility is not to be responsible for delivering stuff, right? Implementation of platforms, tools, rolling out of business intelligence, analytics, et cetera, data governance methodology and practice. These are all good and important and valuable things. But we have to take a view that says we are here to help people learn. How are we going to do that? You know, you and I coming coming from you know our, our roles at UCC, pedagogy is is actually part of everything that we do because you have to design the training courses, you, you have to design the the modules and and be very deliberate about what you want to convey to the students, what you want them to learn, what they take away, and set up. Well, the same goes for leaders in our industry. There is a deliberate intent to take people through and that needs some thinking about and and, and acting upon you know think like teachers um there's one other thing that i think is possible possible as an industry and i think there's a lot more to do on this but you know having held up the iphone as a kind of shining example of design making things easy to participate and make use of and that's meaningful and fun, then I think from a design point of view, then there are opportunities for us to lower the barrier of entry to folks. And if we do it really well, then it doesn't even necessarily mean that they recognize that they're learning something new. But there's a delivery, there's a deliberate intent there in all three kind of levels of what I've just talked about. That simple, local conversation, are we actually making sure that the data aspects have been considered? Are we thinking as leaders, not in terms of what am I responsible for delivering, but how am I engaging with people as an, as almost, like I say, as an educationalist? And then thirdly, what can we do by design to ensure that the solutions that we're bringing actually solve a problem but also are engageable in a way that people want to and feel safe in participating in. Yeah, that's very interesting. And it reminds me of conversations we'd before uh, as well, uh, Alan, maybe back, as I say, uh, many years going back into the 2000s, uh, 2010, sorry, you yeah. know, where we spoke about, you know, especially data and design coming together and that uh, in a way there's definitely a need for people in, in the data industry to start with. What are the problems out there? Having an understanding for those that have the problems and then trying to figure out how can data help to address those problems rather than starting with the data itself. Well, so let, I'll give you a little, again, another sort of almost personal story there. When I started out, coming out of doing an engineering degree and coming in industry, and pretty much what I'd learned doing four years of engineering was that I didn't want to be an electronics engineer. That was about as far as I'd managed to get. I, I had enjoyed the software design, the software development modules in my final year at university, and that ended up being <clears throat> the, the trajectory that, that took me into industry. I got a job <clears throat> with um, uh, a, a software um, and, and uh, IT services um, company. But as I started there, then one of the things that became very, very clear very quickly to me was that there was a process of understanding the problem that you are trying to solve and then designing for that problem. And maybe I was lucky in that going through that process, I learned the techniques and methods of good data design, normalization of data. 
you know, being able to identify the characteristics, the fields and the attributes of the data that we're dealing with and how that represents some kind of view of a real world problem, right? And almost immediately we're into the realms there of, of being a translator because you have to translate the business process, the business function, the business purpose into how is it going to be represented in the data and how do we then manipulate the data that we're that we're um, tracking to then feed back into the execution of the business process. So I would absolutely encourage everybody still to go and learn how normalization of data works because you understand more about the construction of data by doing so. I would under recommend everybody to go and under start learning about dimensional design um, in terms of being able to articulate how the data answers questions that we want to ask of it, right? Now, here's the thing. I got all of that as my basis of my industrial learning, because back in the early 90s, and this is still at the very reasonably early stages of relational databases, remember, rather than having everything coded in Fortran or, or COBOL or, or C matrices. That was the way we represented data before we worked out you know, the, the relational database. Once we started to get this idea of relational databases, we were then going, OK, I, I need to be able to design that. I need to represent it. It was all coded in green screen terminals still. right? So you had to understand the underlying engineering to be able to get things done. Right, the underlying principles of how data was decomposed and represented. And then about 1995, 96, 97, we started to get Windows environments, 4GL coding, right? Which actually meant some of those engineering disciplines got blurred and, dis and, and diluted and indeed lost. I can configure a thing based on reusable code uh, fragments and and visual representations and, you know windows uh interfaces etc and very very quickly we started to just put stuff together and configure applications without actually understanding the underlying principles of how the engineering is going on there's an abstraction that happened through 4gl and that has continued you know, and we're now into an environment where folks are talking about low and no code environments, which absolutely makes it accessible to create new solutions, etc. But in some cases, I think it's a little bit the genie's out of the bottle. We would actually get better low and no code solutions developed if we understood the underlying principles and practices of good data engineering good software engineering, good process engineering. Yeah, if you go, go all the way back to your math classes, right? You have to learn one plus one equals two before you then go on and do calculus and trigonometry, um, mm. right? I and, think I, we and I might argue, get back to that. yeah, and I, and I think you're right. I think that basis that we need data people that have those foundations. But at the same time, I'd also maybe argue, Alan, that um, I think, there's a real um, shortage in, in lots of data units in organizations yes. of an understanding of people, even the psychology of how people act, behave, etc. Right. Um, so, and I know you're known uh, as the the, the 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 guy who talks about the fuzzy stuff. You know, so wh wh we, where's that in your in, in your narrative? Well, so, if if you think about it the way I've just described that, right, and I said that on being able to engineer the data, being able to under engineer an application, being able to engineer a process. That engineering is actually a form of communication, right? The way I look at and design a data model is a representation of the data and therefore is a representation of how I want to communicate what that data is telling me. The way I represent a business process, similarly, is a way of communicating what I expect somebody to do and how I expect them to do it. So where I think the disconnect is that we see these things, building a data model, building a data graph, um, 
putting together a business process map as as ends in themselves. I have done my task by producing this output rather than recognizing that these artifacts of whatever form are communication means. And if we say, what is this communicating and to whom is it communicating? Then I get a very different perspective because if I give a data model to you, then you are going to be able to say, I understand that I can interpret it. I can now take the data in that environment and understand what the data is telling me because I've interpreted the schema. If I'm talking to somebody who's never done any data modeling, then presenting them with that data model and saying that's the view of the data is going to be completely meaningless, right? I might as well have uh, presented them with the with the um, calculus for um, nuclear fission. So it's incumbent on us as a community to really think a lot about who are we communicating with, what purpose are we trying to serve with the communication? Is that what level of knowledge and understanding does my audience have? And then take my understanding and the artifacts that represent it, and then moderate it into a way that is digestible, understandable, and meaningful to whom I'm trying to communicate. Mm. And I'd pull it maybe even um, sort of more. Uh, I suppose to an earlier stage, and I, I think there's a real danger that, yeah, look, if we're using data models in particular, it's it's a, it's a language, essentially, it's a language right. not everyone Correct. understands. But I, I think sometimes we preordain and we nearly oblige people that know those skills to come up with the model. So yes. they're imposing their view of what an organization is into that model and poorly communicating. But I think those people need the skills of how do you go out, collaborate, and develop that shared understanding of reality. Sure. So there's there's kind of the kind of two ways of of getting to the result of we understand the business, we understand the problem, we understand our data. I can come with a preformed view that says banks are banks and they all function in a pretty similar fundamental way therefore it should be possible to have a representation of the information that's used in a bank the services that a bank offers the processes that a bank follows and here is a templated view that we're going to baseline everything off again as a straw man representation of this is how a bank works and i'm bringing that to you and saying right there may be subtleties around it but basically that's the answer now what's your problem I mean, we've seen that in, in various industries, the, the telemanagement forum, TM forum, has done an awful lot of work looking at data models, process models to create a, an industry standard view of uh, the telecom sector. Why? Well, because it's then valuable to allow those telecoms operators to interoperate, right? If I'm I'm making a telephone call to you, I'm on one network, you're on a different network. It wouldn't help if they were those telecoms companies were using different protocols, right? That we need the same understanding of each other to be able to communicate. If I was trying to send you, you know, a hundred euros down the wire, if my bank has a different protocol for how money is represented to, to the way your bank is represented, sorry, Poddy, but you're not getting your money. Right. So that templated view. We have done the thinking for you so you don't have to. Here are the answers. What are your questions? Is a valid approach. It's still incumbent on us to then communicate that into who's going to make use of those predefined models and representations. That's the communication piece. I've got to bring people with me to understand it and be able to engage with it. The other opportunity is to say, well, let's start from first principles. Let's put people in a room, have a discussion that says, do we understand anything about what we're trying to achieve here? What problem are we trying to solve? What are you trying to do? Why are you trying to do it? I mean, this is the essence of, of, of design thinking, right? Is that we're, we begin, walk a mile in the shoes of the person whose problem we're trying to solve. Let's understand their context, bring that into the discussion. And then through the dialogue, the debate, the dialectic that we have out of that conversation comes our understanding of what we're trying to solve 
and then we can decompose that into well, what data is involved and what process is involved, what's the etc. Now those two things are it's not a, it's not an either or. Either we take the templated straw man, dump it on people, and say <laughs> there's the answer, or start with a blank sheet of paper. Um, have the conversation, see what emerges. Actually, both of those are complementary. Yeah. And depending on the scenario that I'm in, do I want to accelerate getting to an answer? Then I probably want to try and pre-think things and, and have that representation to, to then test the proposition. If I'm trying to engage folks in a way that helps them embrace the idea by almost making it think like it's their idea to start with, then I want to take that much, much more facilitated approach. Um, both are valid. Both have their merits, depending on the people we're dealing with, the scenario, the problem we're trying to solve. M many, many problems have actually already been solved multiple times, and we should be able to come in and say, this is how this works. You know, if you want to start up a bank, you know, you, you go and look at all of the protocols for how the banking services already operate and you plug into them. If there are um, uh, you know, scenarios that we haven't dealt with uh, previously, like how would I go about transferring value in an environment that was completely peer to peer without using banking entities as the broker of our exchange of value well maybe nobody's done that before so much it's certainly not accepted by society as a standard practice you know we're seeing um cryptocurrencies and so on start to take a degree of hold and emerge as a practice but certainly still not mainstream and not accepted by the vast majority i mean you know, good luck getting my mum or dad to um to Pay, pay me my Christmas present in Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think there are two, uh, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, and for me, they're the, nearly the two key approaches towards data. Uh, and I, I suppose the first one I'd nearly call it like proto-models, prototyping models. Yeah. You you bring models in, and very often it's not necessarily just to say this is the way it is, but you're saying this is the way it could be. Now Correct. let's have a discussion about how different it needs to be. The second then is far more exploratory, you know, yes. trying to grow uh, and explore concepts and maybe grow a model out of it. And I think that's really powerful that, that you, you've sort of clarified those two different Thanks. distinct approaches. Alan, I've also heard you uh, talk a, a good deal in, in the past about the importance it is for people in the data space to be able to build meaningful business cases and not just based on maybe financials, but based on other aspects. Uh, right. So I, I'm just wondering, <laughs> will that trigger some some memories or thoughts? Well, of, you know? it's again, it, it's another form of communicating communication and in this case we're trying to convince somebody to spend money on the things that we want to do now, yeah that's what a business case is right it's like i have an idea we want to proceed with it i have to convince somebody to say yeah let's now in that regard coming up with the answers coming up with the design coming up with the solution is necessary but it's not sufficient because at the point where i say this is the solution this is what we want to deliver develop whatever I've got to convince somebody else to say, yes, I want it too. Right? And we can't just rely upon and trust that they're going to get it and care about it and so on. And in many, many cases, the solutions that are the right thing to do, we've come up with the answer, are not necessarily something that somebody else would think about or say, I desire that. In fact, sometimes quite the opposite. So if we are going to make the case for whatever it is we're trying to deliver, you know, I want to bring this new application. I want to build this new model. I want to create this new service. Then again, it's not sufficient to just say, and I know how it's going to work and it will be brilliant and it will make us a, a million euros. I've got to think about the narrative in a way that says, how do I get somebody else to care about my vision, about my passion, my, about this solution? That's a storytelling view, right? And I have to think about it, not in terms of what do I want to achieve, but in terms of how does what I want to achieve benefit the person I'm trying to convince? What are they going to take out of this? 
what do they see in their situation, in their context, as the reason and purpose for the solution? Now, I see this in all walks of life, both in terms of end user business and in terms of vendors. There are some brilliant vendors out there with fantastic technologies, fantastic solutions. They will tell you what the solution is and they will tell you how it works without any engagement as to why you might want it or where the value to you as a consumer user is. Um, same, I see this in internal departments. They, they, we want to build this data warehouse. We want to create this data lake. We want to create a data platform. And why? Well, because it's a good thing to do. Oh, wait. Yeah, somebody who's running the marketing function doesn't care about data warehouses and data lakes. Somebody who's the head of finance doesn't care about how the database is structured. What problem are they trying to solve? What outcome are they trying to achieve? Not just corporately, by the way, but personally. <laughs> you know, sometimes the benefit is we simplify so I can go home at five o'clock. That's value too. But if I'm trying to get my solution accepted and adopted, make the business case for it. Mm. I've got to do the storytelling that gets the audience to care and be as passionate as we are. And they maybe have a different perspective and yeah. different desires to what we do. And I, I and I'm just after remember, I remember a session, Alan. We, we we had. Don't ask me what year again, but it, it was it was with people from different organisations in in a room. And Alan as Alan D Duncan came in, everyone was talking. Alan's going to talk about data lakes, data whatever you have, uh, data analytics, BI, the whole lot. And Alan was listening to the, uh, some of the uh, I suppose people talking about some of their initiatives. And I remember distinctly turning and turning around. What's the emotional hook here? Right. So it wasn't just what the problem is, but how can you create that emotional well, bridge? In terms of emotional bridge, in that particular case, I probably scared the bejesus out of them. <laughs> There's the emotional response, right? It's it's memorable because there was an emotional uh, um, connection. Whether that's joy, whether that's delight, whether that's just yeah. You know, eyes ablaze, fear, doesn't matter, but we remember the situations and they matter to us when we have some kind of emotional response. When was the last time you had an emotional response about which database I'm going to use? When, you know, when was the last, I'll tell you what, again, yeah, there is an emotional response in a box, right? You get excited, or a lot, a lot of people get excited about my new machine, my new iPhone, yeah? It's not actually even about the functionality it delivers to me or the ability to bank at three o'clock in the morning and make sure I've got enough to pay for my kebab, right? These are all, <laughs> etc. It's an emotional view that says, by using this particular thing, I feel good. And I think in any walk of life, in any you know, profession, when we're trying to create that engagement with people, if we can create, as you say, an emotional connection, an yeah. emotional response, then it's going to be much, much more memorable than if we give them the facts and say, here's the data, you should care. That's right, yeah. And, you know. and, that's, and that's exactly, I think, your argument at the time, Alan. You're, you're saying to these individuals, saying you're building business cases for data initiatives, you have numbers in there, um, you, know, you might have the financials in there, yeah. but what, what emotional connection do you need to create between that business case and those that will be making the decisions in your organisations? Right. And I think that's when the jaws dropped, really, you know, right. that this storytelling, the importance of storytelling was really what you were trying to bring to in to the room that day. Yeah, so the, I mean, the ancient Greeks understood this stuff two and a half thousand years ago. I mean, if, if, if anybody wants to go and read Aristotle's Art of Rhetoric, you know, I mean, the thing that is the most influential in terms of impact is, is, the, is the, the pathos, the, the passion with which we instill into others. And if we can create that emotional response, then, and we're seeing this play out again and again in all sorts of world situations that you know we all have an emotional response to, but 
you know, getting groups, communities, crowds to do our bidding, you don't win the crowd over with a rational argument that says this is a good thing to do. You win the crowd over by creating a sense of passion in them that they feel like this is something they want to do. Yeah, and of course, Alan, then that says, you know, if, if you if you need to be able to create, and I believe everyone in the data space, when creating these business cases, they now need an empathy. They need an empathy for what will carry the day. What are the, What's the emotional yes. story that I need to tell here to get sign off on this business case so that it will create the value that I'm looking to create? Right. And and empathy does not necessarily mean I I actually feel their pain myself, mm. right? There's a kind of um, cognitive empathy, which is to say, as long as I can think about how that other pe person might feel, if I can put myself in their situation, in their shoes, imagine how they might respond to me, then I can actually, I mean, this is getting, this is dirty tricks time, right? But by understanding the likely emotional response of the audience, then I can be very, very deliberate in the way that I choose to communicate to elicit that response or some other form of emotional response that I want to get, right? And that good, all great storytelling achieves that, whether it's writing a book, whether it's uh, you know a play, whether it's a film, whether it's us here just chatting amongst ourselves, buddy, I, I hope the sense that the passion that that we have is is transmitted um, and and felt by proxy, you know. And and that's exactly what storytelling is about: is is instilling some form of emotional response in somebody else. And if you're really really smart, and like I say, it is a dirty trick. Yeah, but you can actually manipulate how other people feel very, very deliberately. It's a cognitive empathy. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to feel that yourself. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really nice differentiation as well, because I think now in design, we even talk about the difference between an emotional empathy, a cognitive um, empathy, and even, you know, a, a, a sort of um, a psychological empathy. But right. I think when it comes to, to change, also as, as data people, we can't give everything to everyone. So you're trying to trade off, make trade offs, but that should be based on an understanding at some level of where we're trying to make the difference too. Alan, I know uh, um, I was telling Telling people I was coming on on, on these calls, and the, it was it was interesting when the points that people brought up, and it's a bit like you know I don't know what a tracker mortgage is, but people are saying what is a data strategy. So at its that's it's that I mean, that is a brilliant and insightful question, and I would love to give you a tiny brilliant, um, insightful answer. Um, let me put it this way. A data strategy is nothing more than a deliberate way of communicating what do you expect to do with your data and why. Lovely. Right? Now, that has all sorts of facets associated with it. But if you can articulate something that everybody can then understand and have a sense of consensus around, what are we doing with our data and why are we doing those things then you have a data strategy yeah it has to be deliberate it has to be articulated in an explicit way and it has to be communicated in a way that, that creates a sense of shared consensus understanding that's not necessarily meaning everybody will agree with it of course but at least they they understand it but if i've got that level of view that says this is what we're trying to achieve this is why we're trying to do it and here's how we're dealing with our data to, to do so then we're a long way forward if you've got those things represented then you've got a data strategy and from your experience alan and we don't need to name any co companies or anything but how many large organizations actually do have an effect of data strategy in your opinion oh how many have a data strategy and, and how many have an effective data yes. strategy? <laughs> so um, you would like to think we're getting to critical mass of how many organizations have a data strategy. Um, it would probably disappoint you. you know, 
to to imagine just how many organizations I do talk to on a regular basis where they are starting out with this idea, that, oh, maybe we should have a data strategy, right? I mean, it's already getting to the point, by the way, that we're saying that is the idea of having a separate data strategy dead or should you just have a business strategy which is so infused with the data view that they are indistinguishable? I'll let that start lie for the moment. But but there's still a fairly significant proportion of the population out there that don't yet have any articulated clear view on what we're doing with our data and why. So that. Now you ask me the second part, which is, how many of those articulations are effective and clearly it's you know it's going to be a, a subset um what i would describe as being effective data strategy is is our understanding of the things that we're trying to achieve and why and how the data plays within that so clearly understood that the effects that we are trying to create in our organization are then specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and timely, right? Smart. Do I have smart goals from a, an expectation point of view, the definitions of success, and are we able to say we've got the data that is able to answer and demonstrate whether we are achieving those smart goals? And there's still a lot of work to do. Um, so again, hopefully today as a prompt for, for the folks who are, are listening to our, our discussion here to firstly get that articulated view of what we're trying to do and why, and then also in the same breath, make sure that it, it is smart and that the data that we're dealing with is able to answer whether we're achieving those things. Um, the last the last time we we did this analysis and we're going through another cycle at the moment but actually the organizations that have an effective data strategy is still less than a third wow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah look, so the progress has been made but it's very very slow right. and and i suppose just to, to maybe uh, to start to wind it up a bit uh alan what is exciting you about this field at the moment, the data field? You know, uh, and what gets you up in the morning saying, you know, God, this is fantastic. This is really interesting. This is this is re-energizing the whole space. It's 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 almost, I suppose. I mean, this I'm, I'm, storytelling. I'm going to be poetic for a moment here, buddy, and say you know, it's the butterfly butterfly wings effect. You know, <clears throat> we can do something here and that has an impact elsewhere that may never find out about. But there are so many opportunities to make our world a better place, you know, whether that's um, financially, whether that's in terms of, um, you know, happiness index i mean there's there's a, a great example um you know the, dubai is act one of their governmental key performance indicators is the that level of happiness of their um citizens and they're actually doing initiatives not only to be able to measure and track the happiness of their citizens but to find out what are the drivers of happiness and then take action to help their citizens be happier um and i'm not getting into the politics of of the middle east and so on but just as an indicator that yeah that these kind of things can be very very aspirational and still be meaningful um and there are so many opportunities yes in business to make more money make more profit get more customers but that can have a knock-on effect and that can mm -hmm. have a knock-on effect and that can have a knock-on effect and actually one of the things that I, I do want to say is that more and more we're seeing almost a corporate responsibility view not just because it's good for business but just because it's good stop right and and the idea of data for good as a means of supporting societies, supporting populations, um, and so on, um, is 
is potentially profound. Clearly, we're living in um, interesting times to cite the supposed apocryphal um, uh, curse. Mm. Um, uh, but there are some interesting things that we're seeing going on about how can data be used to understand and moderate and respond to the humanitarian crisis that we're seeing building in, in Europe. Um, we saw it with the COVID outbreak in terms of being able to pr predict and respond to um, uh, outbreaks more quickly and effectively. And, you know, we learned as we went with the pandemic, um, you know, and so on. There are so many opportunities in business and in society to learn quickly, take action, and then learn from the results of what the actions we've taken. Um, that every day is an opportunity to make a difference, and, and mm. that is hugely exciting to be part of. Mm. That's very powerful, look, and 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 you know, it's this idea of having uh, a sense of purpose. Uh, the, the big why, the golden why, then realizing that data can make a massive transformation towards right. doing that in a more agile way. Sometimes and it, data agile, and agile don't go together. Yeah. Agile and emergent. You know, yeah. my, yeah. I'm telling you my own story again. You know, 30 years passed when I came out of university, not wanting to be an electronics engineer. It was the, the sum total of my um, ambition. And here I am now, 30 years later, you know, having these kind of conversations with world leading organizations and you yourself <laughs> um but you know and hopefully being able to make a difference in ways that i could not have imagined as you know as, as a kind of young naive but eager and keen um university graduate that emergent property of I don't necessarily have to have a very clear specific purpose before I even start, but I need to be open to learning quickly and understanding my purpose, our purpose together. It's that exploration, it's that communication that gives it meaning. Yeah, yeah, powerful. And look, Alan, I know uh, it's time to land this plane. Now, uh, when we get together, I know we could talk forever about even even single aspects of those. And we haven't even sure. spoken about things like the new EU Data Act and how that's going to change things. So maybe there's going to be a follow up conversations in the future between you and me, etc., and our audience here. But Alan, where can people find out more about you? Where can they find you in terms of social media, etc.? So uh, if you do the classic search on your um, search engine of choice for Alan D. Duncan um, to differentiate from the other Alan Duncans out there, and there are quite a few, um, probably most notably um, a member of, uh, of, of the government, you know, who's, who's uh, well documented and has been part of the you know, trade and industry uh, ministry and all sorts of, of things. But, um, you know, that Alan Duncan is not this Alan Duncan. So if you if you Google me um, or, or, or search, search for Alan D. Duncan, um, you'll find me on, on LinkedIn, Alan D. Duncan. You'll find me on Twitter, Alan D. Duncan. Um, and of course, through my connections with UCC, um, you know, we can always set some kind of, of forum, dialogue, whatever. I'm delighted, of course, to, to have these kinds of conversations and, and move the the data-driven society uh, idea forward, hopefully in meaningful and fulfilling ways. I agree 100% and, and, and touch wood, there will be more opportunities of bringing this conversation uh, forward. Alan, uh, I just want to thank you again because it is again you've you've been so uh, I suppose um, free with your time in the past in terms of helping uh, collaborating etc et and I'm sure there's plenty that the audience will have um, got out of the session today you know and and uh, Probably if I just want to put a sort of a, a cherry on the cake, it's it's back to something I've heard you say before. When it comes to data, you know that the hard stuff is hard, but the soft stuff is even harder. That human bit is even harder. So, Alan, thank you so much, um, and I'm sure we'll be talking again shortly. Uh, my absolute pleasure, Poddy, and thanks to to everybody who's uh, shown an interest. Uh, you know, this this is always a delight to do.